what is going on everybody this is another episode of coordinated chaos on this episode of the podcast we'll be going over what happened in nfl week 17 we'll be recapping the whole week as well as we're going to jump into uh, week 18's saturday night uh, slate as well or saturday slate in general's two games on saturday this weekend uh no thursday night football game for this uh, week so uh it's going to be a little bit of a change of pace there but let's go ahead and jump into what happened in week 17 let's start with the thursday night football game that was the browns versus the jets uh, the Browns come out right in this game and start scoring right off the rip. Uh, obviously, fantasy championships this weekend, so it was a you know lots of fantasy implications in all of these games this weekend. Uh, just to start off the weekend with a bang, Joe Flacco comes out and starts slinging the rock around the field just like he has been all season long since he's been with the Cleveland Browns. Uh, and they get a huge win over the Jets. The, uh, the Jets just kind of looked a little bit lifeless in this one. Trevor Simeon couldn't really get anything going on offense other than if he got the ball to Brees Hall, which is he was just an incredible player for them. Incredible play in fantasy if you had him. I unfortunately had uh, the unpleasure to play against him in fantasy, so that was not very kind to me. But I did play the Cleveland defense, uh, and they showed out in this game. They had a touchdown. They had an interception, obviously, uh, pick six, which was the touchdown there. Um, they had a blocked field goal. They had a fumble, if I'm not mistaken. They had a sack. Uh, they had a lot going on in this game, and uh, so they had a pretty good outing in this one as well. So the Cleveland Browns defense is going to keep this Cleveland Browns team in general in contention no matter what. Their defense is just playing at an all-time high. Jim Schwartz doing a great job on that side of the ball for the Browns. And then, of course, on the offensive side, now you have Joe Flacco out there. Uh, old gray beard Joe just out there slinging the ball around and doing such a fantastic job of just – um, getting every bit of uh, you know ounce of of talent out of that offensive side of the ball with even with Amari Cooper out in this game they still had a lot of offensive production. Jerome Ford had a good game. He had two touchdowns uh, in this one, and uh, man, they are just taking advantage of of what they have on offense, and that defense is just cleaning up the rest of it right now. So the Browns look like they're so good. Uh, and I'm kind of pulling for them a little bit uh, just to make some noise in the AFC playoff picture. I don't know how far they'll go, um, but right now they are in the five seed right now, obviously, because the Ravens are the one seed. So uh, that's the division winner and all of that. So they couldn't be a higher seed, unfortunately, for the Browns. But they are one of the better teams in the AFC playoff picture right now, to be honest. Let's move on to the Lions versus the Cowboys. Just an crazy controversial end to this game. It was a good game back and forth pretty much all game. Uh, very physical it seemed out there cd lamb had a ridiculous game over 200 yards receiving in this one uh he was it seemed like he was catching every single pass from Dak prescott in this game um they were utilizing him as, as they should he's one of the better receivers in all of football and they were utilizing him the way he needs to be utilized which is frequently uh early and often pretty much anytime you can give him the ball get the get the ball into the playmakers hands and let them work and see what happens and usually good things do happen for an offense when that's when that's the case when you're game planning and scheming for your best players uh you're going to get very good offensive production uh and then obviously the very end of this game um you, you got the controversy with the uh ineligible man uh downfield or or ineligible touching uh, because the guy did, or the offensive lineman Taylor Decker supposedly did not uh, report as an eligible receiver on the play to the ref. Uh, the ref sees a couple different guys in his, I guess, viewpoint at that point in time in the game, and he saw, um, I think, Dan Skipper come on the field number seventy, who he ends up calling as the eligible guy on the play, which he was inside the offensive line he, he wasn't the end guy on the line which is just a weird thing for the ref to assume he would be the one considering where he was going to end up lining up so the ref essentially got the call wrong uh they they score the two-point conversion to win the game the detroit lions do there they pass it to to uh taylor decker there in the end zone and everybody thinks the detroit lions wins you know win the game the flag comes out and uh, they say that it's illegal touching because he touched the ball because he was an eligible receiver because he didn't report um a lot of evidence come out already about the fact that this is not the case pretty much Everybody jump in on it. I've never seen so much media jump on the side of like the players and the side of, or the, just not the ref side. Let's just put it that way. Basically, I've never seen ESPN immediately be like, I think the refs blew it, essentially. Um, there was, you know, obviously some referee guys and stuff of that nature on social media and even on like ESPN trying to defend the, you know, the call and whatnot, but it just, 
it, it never really, like, it, it all seemed so desperate in, in a way to just try to, like, brush it under the rug. But it was never going to be the case because everybody saw it. It was very blatant that uh, Taylor Decker went over and reported as eligible. Basically, the ref made a mistake. He apparently just didn't hear him or just, I don't know what happened in that, in that like, exchange right there with the three offensive linemen. Um, but he just got the call wrong, and it cost the Lions the two seed. It cost the Lions you know, home field advantage in certain situations in the playoffs picture in the NFC. So that's very unfortunate for them. This obviously puts the Cowboys in position to go into the two seed if the Eagles were to falter, which is exactly what happened later on in the week or the weekend. And uh, yeah, just a lot of playoff implications there with those two teams and seeding and stuff of that nature. So very unfortunate for the Lions. Lions, big loss there because of that. And the Dallas Cowboys go on to win the football game on a little bit of a fluky situation, fluky play. Um, I, you know, obviously as an Eagles fan, I don't feel like the the Dallas Cowboys should be getting gift wrapped wins at this point in the season, but it is what it is, and uh, they are now the two seed. Let's move on. Dolphins versus Ravens, probably the the game of the weekend for a lot of people. They were looking at this matchup, saying, "Look, this is going to be the best game," um, and it <laughs> turned out to be a good game for like the first maybe half. Really, uh, the Ravens came out and they were firing on all cylinders. Lamar Jackson cemented himself as the MVP favorite um, after this game. He is going to win MVP because of this performance for the most part. He had over 300 yards passing, five touchdown passes. Uh, he just put his stamp on uh, this season and said, I'm the best player in football this year. Uh, and he deserves it, man. He, he really showed out the last few weeks of the season, beating, uh, obviously, the Dolphins and the 49ers. Uh, just a great turnout for the Ravens going forward. Um, they look like the best team in all of football right now. Um, you know, I, I still had an inkling that maybe maybe the 49ers were still the better team. They just had, didn't have a great day against the Ravens that day. But what they've also done now to the Dolphins, who, who run the same type system, the Shanahan-type offensive system and, and stuff of that nature, I just think at this point you can't really deny the fact that the Ravens are the best team. They have the best player. They have the best the, – the, the player that's playing the best at the best time, which is right here at the end of the season going into the playoffs – and uh, I just think the Ravens are poised to go to the Super Bowl and potentially win it all. Um, so, yeah, Ravens playing great football. Dolphins faltering this one a little bit. They just couldn't really get a whole lot going on offense. Uh, the defense got super banged up in this game. Bradley Chubb gone for the season with an ACL this late in the season. That's very tough. It's tough in general when injuries happen. Xavier Howard also had to leave this game because of a foot injury, I believe. I don't know what the, the full status is on that just yet, but um, if he has to miss extended a you know, period of time through the playoffs, then that's going to hurt them a whole lot on defense as well. Uh, so two big losses on defense there. Raheem Mostert didn't even play in this game due to an injury. I don't even know where that one came from necessarily. Um, I don't know if it happened at the beginning of the game. I didn't get real, a real good answer on that one. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of bad injury luck happening at the very end of the season here for a uh, Dolphins team that have you know aspirations to make it to the Super Bowl, um, but just not a great showing against one of the AFC top favorites in the Ravens. So Ravens get a huge win, and like I said, they are they are the one seed. They've locked themselves into the one seed in the AFC, and they are poised to go to the Super Bowl. Uh, and to be completely honest, as an Eagles fan who doesn't think the Eagles are going to make it very far in the playoffs, I think they're probably going to be one and done. I am officially pulling for the Ravens to win the Super Bowl at this point because I think the Eagles are going to get smoked in the playoffs. But let me get to that later. Bills versus Patriots. This one, look, the Bills just got the job done. It was not pretty. Bailey Zappi threw some bad interceptions in this game that essentially kind of handed the Bills the game win. The Bills were not really even playing well on offense, uh, but they, you know, they they escaped with a win. That's all they needed to do. Um, I feel like the Bills are one of those teams where they kind of play down to their competition. Um, they just, I feel like they get up for the big games and they play well against the good teams, and then against the bad teams, they just kind of like go in a little bit too nonchalant and just don't take it as seriously as they should. Um, and so I think that was kind of the case in this game as well. Um, but this is also kind of how the Bills have operated all season, where it's just a little bit Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. They're a little bit up and down. Uh, Josh Allen could have a, a, an off day where he throws a bunch of interceptions and things of that nature. He did have one pick in this game, but it wasn't too egregious. But 
Um, you just can't do that moving forward if you're going to be considered a real Super Bowl contender. Um, I still think they can get hot potentially and, and make it to the Super Bowl and potentially even win it depending on who's coming out of the NFC. But um, the Bills still winning, which is good for them. They are currently the sixth seed at 10-6. and six, So um, they're looking forward to uh, trying to make some noise in the AFC playoff picture as a wild card. Let's move on to the Texans versus the Titans. This one was a huge one for the Texans. Getting C.J. Stroud back, uh, Nico Collins back in the lineup. Obviously, he's been in there the last couple weeks now, but um, just having him back as well. Um, the defense has been playing decent for the Houston Texans uh, in this game. They did just enough. Uh, they, they didn't have a whole lot of crazy offensive production on that side of the ball, uh, but the Titans are, are, a, are a rough crowd. They, you know, Vrabel and those guys, they just never lay down, so you always have to play them to the last second to the to the last whistle of the game they're never going to lay down for you so uh, and as a division rival you know they know each other well so the Texans get a big W there and they are now tied three-way tie basically for the AFC South there with the Colts and the Jaguars so that's going to be super interesting going down to the wire in this last week of the season just to see who ends up technically being the AFC South division winner as well as who's going to end up being one of the wild card uh, teams as well. Let's move on to the Colts versus Raiders. Once again, same deal. AFC South opponent um, playing the Raiders. Colts get another big W. This was just, uh, once again, another, um, you know, just badge of honor for Shane Steichen, who um, just we have learned or I have learned as an Eagles fan was probably the uh, the straw that stirs the drink for the Eagles last year in 2022 when they had such a good year. Uh, he leaves. The Eagles obviously goes to Indianapolis and is – putting together a playoff type AFC contender um, with Gardner Minshew as his quarterback, uh, because obviously Anthony Richardson got hurt early on in the season. Uh, I'd be interested to see what would happen if he still had Anthony Richardson. I would assume they'd probably be a little bit better than they are right now, but I could be wrong. I could be you know, wrong in the fact that maybe Gardner Minshew is just kind of more of a stabilizing figure back there for the time being. He's just a little bit more experienced and things of that nature. So, um, but Shane Sykin doing a great job winning once again, like I said, tied in the AFC South for the division slash one of the wild card positions uh, at nine and seven. So, uh, very good coaching job on his part getting them to this position. Let's go on to the Jaguars versus the Panthers. Once again, AFC South, um, and they get the job done. They win 26 to zero, blow out um, and shut out the Carolina Panthers. Um, in this one, a uh, video comes out of David Tepper, the owner of the Panthers, throwing a drink on a, on a uh, Jaguars fan, I guess, right right at the end of this game. He might have been talking junk through the uh, the press box or the, the suite, whatever he was sitting in, uh, and he gets a drink thrown on him, and it's just not a good look, obviously, for a, a owner who's gotten, or who's getting a lot of um, you know scrutiny right now because of the fact that he just kind of doesn't look like a great owner. There's a whole lot of meddling going on with like the coaching staff and things of that nature, meeting with the teams when he probably shouldn't. Um, you know, the, the leaks coming out about him, you know, kind of being the guy that more or less picked Bryce Young over CJ Stroud, stuff of that nature. A lot of weird stuff going on for the Carolina Panthers and ownership. And uh, I just, I feel bad for Panthers fans at this point um, because an owner, you can't really... You can't really wait on like a head coaching, you know, process to go through and like, you know, you just can't put a, a stamp on an owner who he owns it. Like he, the only way you get out of this is if he sells, if you like make him unprofitable essentially. So that would just mean the Panthers would have to like, or Panthers fans would have to essentially like boycott season. Like, I don't know. There's just no real way out of this, unfortunately, unless he just learns the hard lessons of owning a team and just taking a step back and letting, um, you know, his general manager make the hires and and just basically hiring a good general manager to, to make sure he manages everything for him uh, instead of having to meddle in all the stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff that he probably already does. Um, yeah, like I said, feel bad for Panthers fans. That's not the point here, though. Jaguars get the win. And they uh, they get it done with C.J. Beathard. Uh, Trevor Lawrence is not playing this game. Um, and, man, uh, like I said, the Jaguars and the Colts and the Texans are all tied for the AFC South lead right now. Honestly, for me, I think, like I said, the last two weeks, they have they dropped two games with Trevor Lawrence in, you know, in the lineup. And I just don't think they're necessarily a great team right now. Um, I think Press 
Taylor as the offensive coordinator is a disaster. I think he's a problem over there. Uh, and so they're only beating up on the bad teams, losing to the good teams. And I don't really want to see them, to be completely honest, in the playoffs in the AFC because I think they're just going to be a quick and easy out for somebody. Um, so I just I'd rather see the Colts or the Texans in that position. It'd be a much more fun and competitive game if they're in there. Uh, that's just my two cents. Let's move on to the Rams versus the Giants. Man, this game was crazy. Um, I would have never thought the Rams would even let the Giants even close in this game uh, based on the way the Rams have been playing as of late. But the Giants fought back. Tyrod Taylor gets the start in this one, and he's he was playing well, man. Like They had a real chance to win this game uh, and just kind of blew it at the end there. Um, Rams escape a very scary loss that could have, you know, meant some things playoffs wise for them and seating wise for them if they would have dropped this game um so uh kudos to them for hanging on in this one and continuing to win and trying to get uh a higher seating in the nfc playoff picture they are currently the sixth seed at nine and seven uh so they'll stick there for the time being uh but it looks like they'll they'll probably get another wins they'll probably end up um, 11 and or uh, 10 and 7 on the season, I should say. Uh, they'll beat the 49ers, who will be resting their starters in Week 18. Um, so that's going to be huge for them. They'll probably still be the sixth seed. Um, so that's I, I wouldn't personally, if I was a high seed in the NFC playoff picture, want to play this Rams team. I know they almost just lost to the Giants, but I think that's just one of a one-off type of situation where the Giants had their like last ditch effort. It was like their dying breath, and they just gave it all that they could in week 17 and um they're, they're gonna fight for brian dayball um but like i said i think the rams are just hot right now and they're a team that nobody wants to play uh including like my eagles further down the road i just don't even think the eagles get there at this point so uh, let's move on to the cardinals versus eagles game this was an absolute collapse and disaster of epic proportions uh the eagles were up i think it was 21 to 6 at halftime and they let the Cardinals score, I think, on seven straight possessions in this game, uh, mostly all of them touchdowns. Uh, and they got back in this game, obviously, and it was tied. The Eagles had the ball with like four minutes left when it was tied. They were on the Cardinals side of the field, and then a uh, basically a scenario where they, they had a first down. They got a holding call on a DeAndre Swift outside run. Uh, which backed them with the first and 20. Then they went QB power that got them like four yards. Then they went uh, an RPO you know, type play where Jalen decided to keep it and try to follow his blocks, which got completely blown up uh, by Buda Baker. And he loses the same four or basically three that he gained. Uh, and so then it was third and 19 and then they run a bubble screen. They actually first, they have to burn a timeout because they couldn't get the play in on time. Then they throw a bubble screen to Kenny Gainwell on third and 19 and get like four yards to kick the field goal, uh, to go up only by three there. And, uh, that just pretty much led to the demise of the Eagles there at that point, they kick off to the Cardinals and, uh, they they just go down the field and score a touchdown with James Conner, and that was all she wrote. That was that was it. Uh, the Eagles had uh, very little time at the very end there. The Eagles or the Jalen Hurts throws a hail mary to see if they could potentially get a win, and uh, it gets intercepted, which had fantasy implications for me because I had him as the quarterback, and I lost by less than two points in the fantasy championship. And that interception uh, is obviously minus two points whenever you throw one of those. So. Uh, just an absolute doubling down of epic proportions for me and fantasy and my fandom, all of the above. It was just not a good day on New Year's Eve for me. Um, but yet, yeah, Eagles completely collapse. Cardinals get a win that they probably honestly shouldn't have even tried to win because they went from the number two uh, spot in the draft position this offseason to number four and with one win. Uh, it, it all but locked up, and I'm pretty sure it did lock up, the uh, Bears being the number one pick in the draft, which is going to be interesting for them to see what they'd end up doing with that, uh, obviously because they have a decision to make on Justin Fields. Um, but, yeah, Cardinals get the win. Eagles collapse. I think the Eagles are going to get bounced in the first round. They do not look like a serious team right now. The defense can't stop anybody. Uh, pretty much everything Kyler Murray wanted to do on Sunday, he did, and it was just it was way too easy. Uh, running the ball, James Conner did whatever he wanted to, and then passing the ball, Kyler Murray was just uh, slicing and dicing the Eagles' defense up. And then on the offensive side of the ball, it's just miscommunication 
It's uh, not getting the calls in on time, having to burn timeouts. It's uh, situational play calling. Uh, it's, the problem is not Jalen Hurts. The problem is not the talent. The problem is not A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith or Dallas Goddard or the offensive line, for that matter, or DeAndre Swift, who they underutilize. It's not any of that stuff. It is the coaching. It is the play calling. It is all of it above, and, and all of that falls on the shoulders of Nick Sirianni. And unfortunately, I hate to even say this right now, but I think um, heads need to roll. I think everybody's got to go. Um, it, it probably won't happen. Nick Sirianni probably, probably will not get fired this offseason. Uh, I wouldn't doubt that the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinators get cleaned out um, and you bring in two new coordinators. Once again, another offseason with brand new coordinators. But it is it has to happen because what's happening right now is coaching malpractice. So it is what it is. Uh, Saints versus Buccaneers. This game obviously had a lot of implications once again. Uh, but Tampa Bay stays in their position as the four seed for the time being at eight and eight. But the Saints get the win here, which was huge for them because they are now uh, the nine seed looking to potentially win in week 18. I don't know what all they need. I haven't looked all that stuff up, but essentially the Saints still have an outside chance of uh, winning the division as well as um, making one of the wild card spots in the NFC. So that's going to be very interesting to see what happens in week 18. They're obviously playing for a lot. Um, but yeah, Saints get a huge win here. I mean, just absolutely uh, outplay Baker Mayfield and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in general. They Tampa Bay tried to make a little bit of a run at the very end of this game, but it was a little bit, you know, too little, too late for for them to really get anything going. Like like actually like going like there was just no real chance. It felt like they were actually going to get back in this game, but uh, saints come out and jump out to a huge lead. And then uh, Tampa Bay had to scrap and claw their way back into this game and um, ends up, you know, the saints win it. Um, but Alvin Kamara gets hurt in this game, which is not good. He says he's day to day, which is good. Um, but otherwise uh, everybody else is, is pretty healthy for the most part, I believe on both sides there. So they're going to be competing for the, you know, NFC South as well as a wildcard spot going forward in week 18. So that'll be interesting to watch as well. 49ers versus commanders. 49ers take care of business just like I thought they would. Um, you know, I thought maybe if J Jacoby Brissett played in this game, they would have a chance to potentially beat the 49ers. And it was competitive a little bit in the first half with the 49ers and the commanders in this game with Sam Howell at the helm. Um, but Jacoby Brissett couldn't end up going because of a groin injury. Uh, I don't even know when he really sustained that, if it was in the game last week or if he did it during practice this week. I did, it just popped up on the injury report, and uh, Sam Howell ended up getting the start there. So, um, But, yeah, they, they were competitive in the first half. They, they didn't let the 49ers completely roll them. Um, but a lot of that, I, I feel like, had to do with the fact that Christian McCaffrey did get a little bit banged up in this game. It looks like he's going to sit out, but so is all the starters for uh, the, the 49ers, it looks like, in Week 18 because they locked the one seed because of the Eagles' loss. Um, so I I think Christian McCaffrey is going to be fine. It, it seems like they were taping up his ankle during the game, but they said it's a calf that he's kind of like monitoring right now. So uh, going forward, obviously, you have to monitor that and see what happens with him. I think he's probably going to be fine for the playoffs. Uh, obviously, they don't have to play this week, and they're, they're going to get the first round by. So they're going to have two weeks off. He's going to be fine, I believe, uh, to start off the playoffs in the NFC picture. Um, but yeah, so they roll the commanders, nothing crazy to see here. Let's go on to what happened. The Steelers versus the Seahawks game. This game was close all game long for the most part. These two teams, obviously both of them trying to stay in contention in both their respective conferences. Um, and you know, obviously the Steelers get the job done. Mason Rudolph, since being in there has been uh, a stabilizing factor for that offense. He's just getting the, the ball to his playmakers, which the Steelers have plenty of really. I mean, Deontay Johnson's a good player. Uh, maybe he doesn't give a whole lot of effort. Uh, I mean, you can be that can be said for a lot of players on offense there. But uh, Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, good players. Pat Fryermuth is good. Uh, Jalen Warren and Najee Harris are, are both decent players. Jalen Warren's a really good player. I think Najee Harris is just a decent player. Um, but the defense for the Steelers can play well. Their pass rush is good, but uh, their, their back end is, is a little bit susceptible to uh, you know big plays and stuff of that nature. But basically, Steelers get a huge win here, and they are now the nine seed. You know, looking 
into trying to steal one of those playoff spots away from one of those AFC South guys, or maybe the Bills if they slip up or something like that. But um, yeah, the Steelers still in it. Steelers will once again, and Mike Tomlin will once again uh, have his team over 500 for like the billionth time in a row. And he's just got that record on lock right now, man. It's just very impressive what he's been able to put on uh, display and, and produce the last however many years, even with very mediocre talent on offense and things of that nature. Uh, just he has done a great, great job, and uh, he looks like he's probably going to get an extension from the Steelers, as he should. He deserves every penny of whatever money they're going to give him. Uh, I would love for him as the Eagles head coach right now, considering what uh, the locker room seems to be doing uh, in Philadelphia. Let's move on. Chiefs versus Bengals. This one was a little bit ugly, obviously. Uh, Jake Browning and the Bengals jump out to a 17-7 lead um, very, very quickly on the Chiefs at home in Arrowhead. Um, but then the, the Chiefs start to uh, kind of roar back a little bit going into the second half, and they end up winning this game at the end of the day. Um, the thing with the Chiefs is I think they can go far in the AFC playoff picture as long as they just play their game. They don't get too cute. Um, their defense is very good. They can stifle opposing offenses. Pat Mahomes has just got to kind of rein it in a little bit. It's going to be hard for him because I know he's a guy that loves to sling it. He's a gunslinger. He is. He wants to make the big plays, and he wants to be a part of the reason why your team wins. But I think right now the best thing the Chiefs can do is rely on that run offense, uh, let Isaiah Pacheco take care of the ball, and just tote that rock up and down the field. Uh, and rely, rely on the defense to just get stops whenever it's you know uh, you know basically present whenever they need to they, whenever it's like just a, a big moment they need to get stops and then Pat Mahomes just has to slice and dice and kind of carve up defenses he can't just rely on a big play because his playmakers just aren't reliable right now the only guy on that offense that's reliable right now is Tra Travis Kelsey and Rasheed Rice and it's only two out of however many other players that are out there right now I mean you got Justin Watson MVS. Um, Kadarius Tony in and out um, is just not a great gambit of weapons out there for him right now. So he's just got to play within the structure of that offense right now and just not make mistakes. And if that's the case, I think they can make a little bit of a run. I don't think they'll be, uh, you know, the representative for the Super Bowl this year. I think, like I said, the Ravens will will clearly do that. Um, but yeah, I think the Chiefs can still make some noise if they want to. Uh, they just got to really hone it in. Next game, Packers versus Vikings. This was a, another big one. Uh, you know, the Vikings still had an outside chance of making the playoffs here. If they won, uh, they pretty much get eliminated with this loss. Uh, they only have like a 3% chance. They have, they need a lot of stuff to happen for them to get in. Uh, but Jordan Love and the Packers come out, and they're just slinging the ball around. Just They are such a fun offense to watch. It, I feel like it's like run the ball with Aaron Jones, run the ball with A.J. Dillon, play action pass, uh, Jordan Love, just like play action fake just like, uh, you know, Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers used to do and just absolutely letting it rip downfield. And Jaden Reed just had a crazy game in this game. Uh, just he's such an explosive player. And it's that offense will be scary if they ever can get uh, Christian Watson back because then they'll have him, they'll have Jaden Reed, they'll have Romeo Dobbs. And uh, that is a formidable passing attack especially when you got tucker craft playing well right now luke musgrave sh should be coming back soon from ir uh that that offense is rounding into shape right at the right time right now um the defense really concerns me still joe barry do not think he's a good defensive coordinator um and he's going to let up plays and things of that nature but uh plays couldn't be made against the the vikings in this one uh, because the thing was they started darren hall uh kevin o'connell makes the decision early on in the week that he's gonna start darren hall instead of nick mullins first half is ugly uh darren hall could not play uh he was unplayable essentially in the first half nick mullins starts the second half and uh, they actually get a little bit of a spark and start, you know, moving the ball down the field. And uh, they actually look a real offense at that point. I know Nick Mullins is a guy that is very uh, high risk, high reward because he throws the ball the way like he thinks he's Brett Favre essentially. So he's out there just slinging it and hoping that you know his receivers catch it. Uh, otherwise, it's usually a pick. So. Like I said, high risk, high reward. He got them kind of going in this game a little bit. I was way too little, too late for them because the Packers was up by a ton at this point. But um, that kind of stunk too because once again, I had a fancy player. I had Ty Chandler going in this game. If Nick Mullins would have started in this game, I think I probably would have won my matchup because, like I said, I lost by less than two points. That's neither here nor there, and I am still not over it. If you couldn't tell, so. 
That's it for the week 17 recap. That pretty much wraps it up. We'll go into the week 18 Saturday night or Saturday uh, slate here. We're going to start with the Steelers versus the Ravens. The Steelers are favored by four in this one. Uh, this is mostly due to the fact that the Ravens will be uh, wrestling their starters. They have the one seed locked up in the AFC. So uh, you'll, you'll see Tyler Huntley out there instead of Lamar Jackson. You'll see some of the backups. You'll see Nelson Aguilar out there instead of Zay Flowers, things of that nature. So um, it looks like... Uh, the Steelers also, like I said, they have something to play for. They can still make the playoffs if they win this last game. So they are going to be playing all their starters. They are, they want to win this game. Um, it's still going to be a tough game, I believe. I still think it's going to be close. But I think the Steelers can cover here. I think Mason Rudolph uh, can actually um, get them a win here and, and, and just – potentially put themselves in a position to make a playoff uh, or a wild card spot in the AFC playoff picture, depending on what else ha happens this weekend as well. But I think Mason Rudolph and that offense can get the job done against the backups in Baltimore. All right, let's move on to Texans versus Colts. Obviously, this is a huge game for the AFC South. A lot of stuff riding on this one to see who wins the division, who wins uh, one of those wild card spots between the three Jaguars and the Texans and Colts. Uh, in this one, Texans, it's plus one. So it's essentially a pick them. Uh, and I'm going to go with the Texans, man. Uh, basically, don't have a lot of you know research into this whatsoever. But the one thing I do know is I'm going to bet on the better of the two quarterbacks. Um, and I will go with C.J. Stroud over Gardner Mission right now. Uh, that's the only thing that I'm going off of right now. I just think C.J. Stroud is going to get the job done. Um, would I be shocked if Gardner Minshew and Shane Steichen come up with a, a perfect plan to screw over the Texans and get themselves out of the playoffs? No, I would not. Um, but I, I'm just going to go with with the guy that I think has been making a lot of plays this season and has showed himself as one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL, even as a rookie, and that's C.J. Stroud. So I will go with the Texans uh, plus one or Texans money line, whatever you want to consider it, versus the Colts. That pretty much wraps up the episode of uh, Coordinating Chaos here. I appreciate everybody listening and tuning in. Please subscribe, turn on the notification bells, follow on my TikTok and YouTube and things of that nature. Um, rate, review on you know Spotify, Apple uh, Podcasts, wherever you may be listening to the podcast. I appreciate it once again, and I will talk to you guys next week. See ya.